Today on Principles of Accounting, we're going to be looking at uh, what we call management accounting, and in this case, you, how we use uh, our accounts to take decisions within the business. So far, we've been looking really at judging a business rather than its actual decision making. But when you think about it, uh, all decisions in business do require uh, a financial calculation of all decisions of any uh, import. <coughs> they all require uh, some calculation. So how should that calculation be made for the major decisions? These are the learning outcomes for you. And so we have, first of all, a definition of a cost. And we've got to be uh, really careful about this because uh, we use cost in a, a loose sense. How much did that cost you? Really means how much did you pay for it? Uh, in business, that's not quite the same uh, because uh, a cost and what is actually paid uh, are two slightly different things. Not every cost is uh, paid for immediately. So um, we're talking about the amount of resources in monetary terms sacrificed in order to achieve a particular objective. So we use the, this word sacrificed to kind of replace payment uh, and uh, we've got to be careful about that. One of the major differences in our calculations is uh, the distinction between uh, a, an opportunity cost, which is the value of an opportunity for gone, sacrifice, that's forward-looking, and what we call historic costs, and that's backward-looking. That is a cost that has already been incurred. And uh, as Stanley Jevons, uh, a professor in the 1900s, early 1900s from Manchester University, said, bygones are forever bygones. So as a general rule, our historic costs are not directly relevant to the decisions we take. Here's some uh, attempt to distinguish uh, what is a relevant cost. Does the cost relate to the objectives of the business? Does the cost relate to the future? And that's what we've just been discussing. And does the cost vary with the decision? If it's no for any of these items, then it's not a relevant cost. And uh, a lot of uh, analysis using finance in uh, within a business does turn around, well, what is the cost? And that is essentially asking, what is the relevant cost? Let's go straight to a little example to illustrate the problems. Garage buys a lorry at 10,000, requires a new engine Two two and a half thousand 2,500, take 20 hours to fit, technicians paid £15 pounds an hour, technicians are short of work, but the garage wishes to retain their services, the lorry can be sold immediately for £9,000. Now you have to imagine yourself in this situation, these uh, scenario type questions do take a bit of imagination. Uh, and the question is, what is the minimum price the garage should charge for the lorry after the engine has been fitted? Well, the first and most obvious thing is that uh, we could sell the lorry for £9,000. So clearly we must be able to uh, sell it for more than £9,000. Otherwise, the businessman or the, the owner is going to be saying, well, you know, let's sell it for £9,000 as, as is. If they fit a new engine, that's going to cost them 2500 So the price must also cover this 2500 they're not going to be fitting it for a loss and they don't want one price to sort of subsidize another so uh, we've got to add the two up and that means that it's got to cover it 11,500 if it was 11,000 that we were getting then uh, we would get 9,000 as it we would cover our 9,000 or you could look at it like this whether we cover our 9,000 but then we've um, bought an engine for two and a half thousand but only got two thousand back on it uh, so that that leaves us worse off we're better selling uh, the engine uh, sorry the lorry for nine thousand and keeping the two and a half thousand pounds because then our total wealth would be eleven and a half 
6,000 instead of the 11,000. So really, if it doesn't cover the 11,500, uh, the price, if we can't do it for that, then the alternative route is going to be better. So, uh, sorry, I'm, the, the question on the side, what is the customer is only willing to pay 10,000? Well, it's the same thing that, that uh, we, we could say that we've covered our 9,000, but then we've only got 1,000 extra and we've had to pay 2,500 extra, so we've made a loss and we're better off um, having our 9,000 pounds in our pocket and not spending the 2,500. Our total wealth will be 11,500 in comparison. So that's the kind of reasoning that uh, we need to take in order to um, answer the question. Now uh, we've got a slightly ex different example. Oh, sorry. One thing we didn't note here is that we didn't include uh, the work by the technicians. Uh, we told it take 20 hours to fit and it's 15 pounds per hour. To, to fit the engine but the problem is they're short of work and they're not going to be doing anything valuable instead they're just going to be sitting around so they might as well do this work and it, it's not really a cost of the job because it, uh, it we're, we're going to be paying them uh, anyway whatever we pay them so uh, as we're paying them anyway uh, where we assume they're on not on piecework, that they are on salaries and <clears throat> with these questions sometimes there are little loose ends and you have to make a reasonable assumption as long as you write down the assumption that's fine. So uh, we're going to be paying them in any case so it, the uh, payment we make to them isn't affected by our decision and therefore it's not a relevant cost. That was one of the criteria we had um, does the cost vary with the decision? No, so it's an irrelevant cost. We have a slightly different uh, variation on this uh, here. So a garage bought the lorry for 10,000, requires a new engine, 2,500, that's a relevant cost. Technicians will be paid 15 pounds an hour. They are busy and are charged out at 50 pounds an hour, right? So, um, and it take 20 hours to fit. The lorry can be sold immediately for £9,000. That's what you call an opportunity cost. So, uh, we've got the opportunity cost of the lorry, as before. We've got the cost of the new engine, that must be covered. But now, in addition, we've got the technician's time. Because we're using them for this job, it means that we're not charging them out for another job at 20 hours at £50 an hour. So... Uh, this is uh, a lost opportunity, L uh, business delayed and possibly lost. So £50, it does vary with the decision. So £50 times 20 hours is our £1,000 here. So now we do have to cover the technician's cost because uh, if they were not working on this job, they would be working on another job and they would be earning our £1,000 for us. So uh, that is a, an opportunity for gone. And that should be, whoops. Uh, does the cost vary with the decision? Does the cost relate to the future? Uh, yeah, okay. So um, it, it is the cost varying with the decision. So now we don't have the ability for these other jobs that would they would have done. Here's uh, a, another example. J Limited is bidding for a contract that will require 800 units of alpha. Material is currently held. Information is as follows. Historic cost is always not going to be relevant in these type decisions. <coughs> is um, resale alpha is no longer used by the business. So uh, that's part of the question, really. Uh, what is the minimum price paid for alpha for the inclusion in the contract bid? So it's it's no longer used uh, by the business. So we're not going to be replacing it. We're going to be selling it. So the opportunity cost is the resale value. 
So it's our 800 units times 12. And that's what we have here, 800 units times 12, 9,600. Same question, but this time the material is currently held and the information is as follows. So we're going to be replacing it. So the opportunity loss, as it were, is the replacement cost because alpha is in regular use. What is the minimum price for the contract bid? And this time it needs to be replaced. It's cost of the decision. We don't do this as we need to. Re we don't. We wouldn't charge at this rate because uh, uh, we need to replace it. And historic cost is never going to be relevant. Bygones are forever bygones. Right, so relevant costs is uh, one of the areas of decision making. I ju just make a, a brief note on that in that it is really for one-off type decisions. So typically for contract type costing, relevant cost considerations become very important. <coughs> um, now, uh, for uh, decisions that are not one-off, that are more run-of-the-mill, we need to look at the behaviour of costs in a slightly different way. And <coughs> we have this general classification of costs that they're either fixed or they're variable. And they're variable in relation to the volume of activity. So for decisions that are related to the volume of activity, we need to distinguish between those costs that are fixed and potentially not relevant and those that are variable. But also, <coughs> in decisions such as this, we tend to think of the business as a whole, and uh, we want uh, obvious, obviously to include the survival of the business. So, <coughs> although the fixed costs don't vary with the actual output, we nevertheless need to cover them uh, from the point of view of the business as a whole. We can't, as in uh, relevant type costing, we can't sort of single it out as just uh, ring fence it as a, just an individual contract, because now we're talking about uh, production and output as the main activity of the company, and it must return a profit at the end of the day, and that includes covering our fixed costs. So uh, fixed cost, in case anyone is any in any doubt, it runs like this in relation to the volume of activity. It does not vary. Variable costs, if we look at it in detail, in fact, it's probably fixed over a certain length of time before uh, we need a new machine, we need new space, uh, some extra equipment is needed, and that's a sort of one-off cost. Then it covers the next range and so on. So often they're what we call step costs. And, you know, obviously if the steps are big, then that becomes an important part of the decision. But uh, for the most part, we'll be uh, assuming that costs vary with the volume of activity in this very smooth way, uh, which is uh, perhaps not realistic, but hopefully we can get some general statements about uh, are how we manage costs to take decisions. So if we look at our total costs, we add together our fixed costs and our variable costs in relation to the volume of activity. So this uh, red line here is the total cost. I think that's straightforward. Now it gets uh, a little bit more complicated where we put in the revenue line. And the revenue, revenue now line is now the red line. And we've put that on top of our total cost line, which is the blue line. So where the blue line is above the red line, we've got loss, which is this gray area here. And where the revenue red line is above the blue line, the total cost line, we've got an overall profit. And we've got this point here where they equal each other total costs equals total revenue and that we call the break-even point and this is useful it's used very widely in business uh, somebody who knows nothing about the accounts or finance will will certainly know about the break-even point what's the break-even point at what point do we start making a profit how much do we have to produce in order 
to get an overall profit? What's our level of activity? What does it have to be? So all these questions are answered by our break-even analysis. So it's an important part of business uh, decisions. To calculate the break-even point, uh, quite simply, it's fixed cost over sales revenue minus the variable sales revenue per unit minus variable cost per unit. So we can see it really as our need to cover fixed costs that don't vary with uh, production. And for every unit we sell, we gain the revenue per unit less the cost of making that unit. And that's called the contribution. It's because it contributes to our fixed costs and it's per unit, so we're effectively asking how many of this contribution per unit do we need so that the benefit we get equals the fixed cost. So if we have a look at the equation here, we've got the profit equals uh, sales, per, uh, sales price per unit times the quantity minus the variable cost per unit again times the same quantity. So that together is the contribution per unit minus the fixed costs gives us our profit. Right, so th this is the, the revenue minus the variable costs minus the fixed costs. That gives us our profit. The break-even point is where the profit is zero so uh, as these are both multiplied by Q, we can take them out and put S minus VC, so the sales per unit minus the variable cost per unit times quantity uh, minus the fixed cost is zero profit. So that's Q asterisk is our break-even point. In the book it calls gives it a little b uh, with an asterisk, I believe. Um, and uh, but I've used Q to emphasize that it's to do with quantity and fixed cost over sale uh, as we were saying sales minus variable cost per unit and that gives us the number of units so it's just taking Q and putting it on the other side here to find out what the break-even quantity is so that's the derivation of our formula here fixed cost, which is that, uh, divided by sales revenue minus uh, per unit minus variable cost per unit, which is that, and that's the dividing sign. Uh, and this is it in words. And I introduced the term contribution per unit to summarize this. Just It's just a convenient way of naming this uh, on the denominator side. Break-even points and load factors, uh, it gets called lots of different things. Load factors is actual usage. Firms like to develop their own sort of language. So load factor in a, to another company wouldn't mean a great deal. Uh, this is Ryanair, of course, a rather controversial uh, company at the moment as they've messed up their rotor. Um, <laughs> I don't know what the details are, but <laughs> sounds as if somebody um, put in a, a wrong number or made a mess of a computer program or something. But anyway, uh, break-even points are clearly enough. They need it 70% full. They're playing 70, about 70 to 72% full. In fact, they get them up to over 80% full. So uh, the difference between the two, the break-even point is not always 70, but uh, the profit they're going to make is going to be the difference between, based on the difference between the two. And here we have the contribution and contribution of sales revenue is the contribution margin ratio, uh, <clears throat> a bit like a gross profit uh, ratio, a gross profit margin rather. So uh, that's, uh, uh, but in this context we call it contribution margin ratio. And here we have some data on the current market price. I don't know if it is the current market price, but you can see that uh, it 
sometimes prices can be below uh, break-even prices, losses are made, sometimes above. It's all a little bit um, abstract in the case of oil production because often they take it as the price to the petrol pump, the wholesale price, but they own the retail operation anyway, so what they lose on the wholesale price they may well gain on the retail price. So uh, one has to be hypercritical about these measures as to whether they really are measuring what they purport to be measuring. <coughs> but uh, as we can see here, costs are different according to the source, and some are not so economic and some are still economic. So in that way uh, the uh, break-even can be used to take decisions. If we can't get to break-even then the activity is not going to be profitable. So that's obviously of significance. Here we have a general uh, comment on a very, very important issue, and that is the contribution of machinery. Increasingly these days, if you look at programs such as how it's made, you'll see the level of automation is utterly ridiculous. Uh, I think the last one I saw, they were x-raying each apple to see if it was bad or not, and uh, if it was bad, it was just cast off for cider making or something. Um, <coughs> and uh, this was all done by machine. Uh, so it is uh, uh, the machines can make the most incredibly fine judgments so increasingly we are in an environment where machinery which is essentially a fixed cost is becoming an increasingly part an increasing part of our overall costs and labor which is uh, usually treated as a variable cost is getting smaller and smaller. So much so that I believe some companies are repatriating their operations back to Europe from the Far East because the operation is so automated that they don't, the, the cost of the labour isn't a major part of the operation and there are benefits through having the actual uh, process of, of uh, manufacture close to the headquarters of the company. So um, it, it ha this has a profound effect. How does it affect our break-even point? Well, let's have a look. This is kind of without much machinery, low level of fixed costs, all our costs tend to be variable, and so the blue line, which is our, our uh, red, uh, sorry, the cost line, which is our red line here, <clears throat> varies very much with our output. If there's a low level of activity, then our costs are low, because we're not employing many people. If it, as it gets higher, so our costs go higher, but then our revenue goes higher. So they go very much hand in hand, and so in bad times the losses are not too great, and in good times uh, there are profits, but they're not fantastic. That is the traditional picture, and then if we it's basket making for some reason, uh, then but if we buy a basket making machine, uh, then we have much higher fixed costs, and our variable costs sit on top, but they're not nearly as steep, so the extra cost of making one more is much less, and that the red line gives us our total cost. The difference between the red line and the black line is our variable cost. The relationship between the total cost and the same profit line as before is now very different because if our level of activity goes down we start to make very big losses because we've got these high fixed costs to maintain. It's the, the, the cost of uh, renting the machine uh, things like that, it's maintenance, that sort of thing. These are uh, costs that uh, are going to be more or less fixed whatever level of output. But actually these days contracts can be variable because the uh, person hiring out the machine realizes that this is a problem. But that's, um, we want to stick to the simple picture. 
So when um, uh, production falls down to uh, near zero, we've still got um, you know three thousand pounds in this case uh, to pay out. Whereas here, when production went down to near zero, we only had uh, about five hundred pounds to pay out. So our loss is considerably greater when we have high levels of uh, fixed cost. Also note that our break-even point is higher under the fixed cost uh, arrangement than under the variable cost uh, model, low fixed cost model. So it's higher under fixed cost. So you've got a, a completely different um, model that will affect marketing and all other aspects of the business. They've got to get volume. If they don't get volume, they're in trouble. And that is why we see shops with sales on all the time, that sort of thing, uh, because they they have to get the volume. And if they don't make sales at some level, um, they're not going to be covering their fixed costs. This argument, as you can see, is very similar to uh, the gearing argument we used in uh, an earlier lecture when talking about the level of borrowing and its effect on risk. Uh, this is uh, borrowing was a fixed cost, introduced a fixed uh, interest rate cost. Uh, here again we've got a fixed cost uh, and high levels of fixed costs in our total cost makeup, very similar to high levels of borrowing in our total finance makeup. And we can we this is in fact called operational gearing. So, it, uh, and as you can see, the, the risk is that much greater. We can see that uh, as it goes down, we uh, big losses are made, and as we go up beyond the break-even point, large profits are made. So, business is becoming riskier due to uh, technological progress, and that's obviously a very important feature. Uh, back to Ryanair, it's just describing itself in, in terms of a margin of safety and um, this is margin of safety as a percentage of the break-even point. So how far it is above and this is the operating profit in millions of euros. So that's the operating profit 22% above the break-even point. That's the operating profit, 15% above break-even, 17, 17, so on. So uh, there are a number of ways of expressing the uh, degree of safety, the degree to which you are beyond the break-even point. Uh, and uh, this is important to businesses. And typically in a company, it will develop its own measures that suit its own production activity. So just in general terms, it's the percentage uh, of operating profit and how is the operating profit and how far it is as a percentage above the break-even point. And uh, this is really just restating what we've been saying. So the effect of operating gearing, the proportion of fixed costs, high gearing, high fixed costs, low variable costs, low gearing, low fixed costs, high variable cost, variable costs increase with output, which is bad, but also um, decline with output. That is when output uh, goes down, our variable costs will go down. So that's that word. And fixed costs are the opposite. They do not increase with output, which is good, but they do not decline with output, which is bad. So two very different behaviours uh, and uh, contrasting with the effect of uh, increasing output, as you can see, favours fixed costs. Uh, falling output favours variable cost, or the, the variable cost um, favours companies with higher levels of variable cost. Okay, I, I won't attempt to explain this. It was in the uh, original 
publisher's slides. <laughs> Everything is uh, subject to critical analysis and uh, three general problems of break-even analysis, non-linear relationships, linear means straight line. So uh, the prices may vary so that our total revenue line might not be straight. Typically our prices might <coughs> reduce a bit to get higher volumes. Uh, downward sloping demand curve, that sort of thing. And so our, um, uh, our total revenue line might be uh, convex uh, curved, uh, this, the slope getting gradually less steep. Costs may be stepped, as we were talking about earlier, and in multi-product businesses, total revenue may go up through no change in price, but uh, just people buying a different mix of the products. And so we have to assume a certain type of certain product mix. And uh, that's also an assumption we have to make when looking at the real world. So four key areas uh, in using relevant uh, costs, determining the most efficient use of scarce resources. We saw a bit of that with the labour and the garage, and uh, it had to cover the costs of the alternative use. Closing or continuation decisions, that's kind of break-even analysis, you know, are we going to be making a profit on this? Make or buy type decisions, uh, this can be in a kind of contractual arrangement as we were uh, talking about in relevant costs um, and, and so that that's really kind of our earlier relevant cost decision uh, though we, we've not, not actually looked to make or buy decision pricing and assessing opportunity cost to enter contracts that's again our relevant costing type decision so all these are important decisions. There are other aspects to all these decisions, but you have to do the maths. You have to do the numbers. A good business, a business that survives, will have done its sums. Otherwise, it will face um, poor decision making and the business will fail. So on that happy note, we conclude our look at using costs for decision making. For the seminar there is uh, a uh, question on asking you to identify variable and fixed costs and calculate break-even analysis and certain circumstances and then to uh, critically review break-even analysis. So it follows the uh, traditional pattern of these type of questions. Can you work it out? Do you understand what its uh, value is to the business? So do, uh, do go along to the uh, seminar sessions and check your answer.